All right, so the idea with this video is maybe you're taking an intro to statistics class and you're getting ready for your final exam and you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed about all the different types of confidence intervals and hypothesis tests that you know are gonna show up. You're not new to this stuff. You have a calculator that looks something like this and you know that under the stat menu, you go over to tests and you have this huge list of tests, Z-tests and T-tests, two sample T-tests, two proportion Z-tests. And when you saw these things previously, it wasn't too hard to tell which test to use because if you were in the t-test section, you use the t-test function. But one of the big challenges for your final exam will be that you're not in a specific section. You have to be able to read a problem and map it to one of these different functions. And in addition to these six test functions, you got six more down here that end in the word interval. And maybe you're feeling a little bit overwhelmed. If so, then this video is for you. So here's the way I think about it. For a given problem, the first thing you wanna decide is whether you're dealing with proportions or means. I guess we learned means first, so maybe I'll put that over on this side. And then later we learned proportions, so I'll throw that over here. When you read through a problem, the first thing you wanna figure out is which of these two categories you lie in. What these might look like is, I don't know, you have a random sample of, let's say 200, I don't know, dogs, sure. If the question is about means, it might say something like the average weight in your sample is, I don't know, 40 pounds, sure. If you have proportions, it might say something like, I don't know, 75 of these 200 dogs have some characteristic. I don't know, have fleas. You typically don't see the data itself, but maybe you can kind of picture it, right? We have all these dogs over here, what, 200 of them? And if we were tracking their weight, the observations would be what we refer to as a numeric variable. It's quantitative. I don't know, the first dog weighs 50 pounds, the next dog weighs 20 pounds, the next one weighs 100 pounds, whatever. If we were talking about whether or not they had fleas, the data would look very different. Right? We wouldn't have this numeric data. We'd instead have what's called binary categorical data. It's a yes or a no. This dog does not have fleas. This dog does not have fleas. This big dog right here, yeah, it's got fleas, sure. If the thing we're talking about is either a yes or no, binary categorical, we're dealing with proportions. If the thing we're talking about is numeric, like with weight, we're talking about means. We got a random sample of 200 dogs. The average number of steps taken per dog is 3,000. That's means. 92 of those dogs love to play fetch. Sure, that's proportions. Make sure you can tell the difference. Hint, when you're dealing with means, we can talk about a standard deviation, right? We can talk about how spread out these numbers are. When you're talking about binary categorical data, that idea of a standard deviation makes no sense. You can't talk about how spread out Y's and N's are. They're all either yeses or no's. When you're dealing with proportions, there's no concept of standard deviation. Conversely, when we're dealing with means, we'll always be told the standard deviation, or you'll be given the data and asked to calculate the standard deviation. And you're like, oh yeah, yeah, standard deviation, I remember that thing, that's a uh, sigma, right? Well, kind of. After you decide that you're dealing with means, the next big question that you need to ask yourself is about that standard deviation, which again, won't even exist over here. If we know the population standard deviation, AKA sigma, then it's gonna follow a Z distribution. If you don't know sigma, you don't have a population standard deviation, then what you do is you use the sample standard deviation, kind of the next best thing, S being the symbol that you use for sample standard deviation, then it's what's called a T distribution. Again, over here, we don't have a standard deviation, so we don't have to decide whether it follows a Z distribution or a T distribution. Turns out proportions are always a Z distribution, but you don't need to worry about that because if we go to our calculator here and you look at all of your tests, the ones that say prop on them, the ones that deal with proportions, only have a Z option. There is no T option, because again, proportions always follow the Z distribution. When we're dealing with means, we're gonna have to figure out whether it's a Z distribution or a T distribution. Note, this is pretty subtle, right? When you read a Z distribution problem and a T distribution problem, they look pretty damn similar. They'll both tell you an average or some averages, and they'll both tell you a standard deviation or some standard deviations. You'll have to read the problem carefully and figure out that standard deviation that's given to you. Is it the population standard deviation or is it a sample standard deviation? If you're following so far, then there's just one more decision that we need to make, or I don't know, maybe two, we'll see. Once we figure out whether we have a Z distribution with means, a T distribution with means, or a Z distribution with proportions, we have to figure out how many samples we have. Do you have one sample or two samples? Do we have a random sample of 200 dogs or do we have a random sample of 200 dogs and another sample of 300 cats? Do we have 200 dogs, 75 of which have fleas and then 300, I don't know, chickens? Do chickens get fleas? 
and 100 of those chickens have fleas, whatever. Is there one sample or is there two samples? If there's one sample, then you're gonna use the one prop Z test if you're doing hypothesis testing. If there's two different samples that you have proportions of, then you're gonna use the two prop Z test. What if we're dealing with means and we've decided that we have a T distribution? We don't know sigma. So think, random sample of 200 dogs, the average, I don't know, age is seven years. And the standard deviation of the age of those 200 dogs is 3.6 years. Well, if we only have one sample, then what we have is a T test. Makes sense, right? A T distribution. So it's a T test if we're doing hypothesis testing. What if you have two samples? So think, I don't know, a sample of 200 men, the average height is five foot 10. And in a random sample of 300 women, the average height is five foot seven, whatever. We have two different samples that we have the averages or means of. Instead of using a T test, we would use a two sample T test. In theory, you could make this same distinction if you had a Z distribution. One sample, you'd use a Z test. Two samples, you'd use what's called a two sample Z test. However, in our class, we didn't look at two sample Z tests. So while you'll see this listed on your calculator, you won't see this on your final exam. Nothing wrong with it, we just didn't do it. When we had two samples, we just assumed it was a T distribution. So that leaves us with one, two, three, four, five different options for hypothesis testing. Go to your calculator here, see that Z test is the first thing listed. Here's number one. T test is the second thing listed. Here it is, number two. Two sample Z test. That would be number three over here if you were to see it, but again, you won't in our class. The fourth thing listed is a two sample T test. That's what we have over here. We've now exhausted all of our different hypothesis testing functions for means. And we get down to proportions. Five and six are one prop Z test and two prop Z test respectively. There's five and there's six. I know that's a lot to keep track of, but I have some good news. If that makes sense to you, then it's not six calculator functions you understand, it's really 12 calculator functions you understand because there's an equivalent version of each one of these six that deals with, instead of hypothesis testing, deals with confidence intervals. What I'm saying is just like there's a Z test function that you would use if you had means and one sample and you knew sigma, there's a Z interval function. Similarly, just like there's a two sample Z test, there's a two sample Z interval. Same idea with T tests and two sample T tests. If you were dealing with confidence intervals in those situations, you'd use T interval and two sample T interval. And then finally over here in the world of proportions, just like there's a one prop Z test and a two prop Z test, there's a one prop Z interval and a two prop Z interval. In case you don't believe me, here's the calculator again. There's Z interval number seven. The eighth thing is T interval. The ninth thing is two sample Z interval. The 10th thing is two sample T interval. Again, we're not gonna consider two sample Z intervals. Nothing wrong with them. Just don't expect to see them on your test. If you scroll down further, the 11th and 12th thing, which they list with an A and a B, are one prop Z interval and two prop Z interval. A little overwhelming, but hopefully fairly manageable. However, there are a couple special cases you need to consider. Sometimes you're dealing with means and you have two samples, which again, in our class, because we won't see two samples with the Z distribution, will mean we're over here. Two samples, T distribution. You're like, yeah, you talked about that. I'll use two sample T test or two sample T interval, obviously. Well, no. If the two samples are dependent, AKA matched pairs, then even though you technically have two samples, you treat it like you have one sample. The way you do that is you subtract the columns as we've already gone over. And essentially what you do is you change the two samples into one sample of differences so you don't use two sample T test and two sample Z interval, even though you think you would because you have two samples, you instead use T test and T intervals. What else is tricky? If you're dealing with hypothesis testing and we're talking about means, you're gonna be given a sample mean and a population mean. It might look like two different samples, but they're not. It's one sample and one population. So we're talking about a Z test or a T test, not a two sample Z test or a two sample T test. That's when we're talking about hypothesis testing. You don't have that issue when you're talking about confidence intervals. With confidence intervals, you don't know the population mean because that's what you're building a confidence interval for. So you're just given the sample mean. This idea here is true for T tests and Z tests when we're talking about one sample. When we have two samples, which in our class will only be over here, you'll be given two different sample means, whether we're talking about hypothesis testing or confidence intervals, and you won't be given a population mean 
that's assumed to be zero for two sample dependent or independent hypothesis testing. Again, two sample dependent hypothesis testing is this case that I talked about where we use the t-test function. Two sample independent data hypothesis testing in our class would be a two sample t-test, but in theory could also be a two sample z-test. One last thing that's tricky, back over here in the world of proportions, when we're dealing with hypothesis testing and we only have one sample, one proportion that we're talking about, you'll be given the sample proportion and also a population proportion. You somehow know that the percentage of all dogs in the entire population that has fleas is 33%. In a random sample of 200 dogs from Washington, 18% of them had fleas, you know, whatever. You'll be given a population proportion and a sample proportion. Kind of like over here where we were given a population mean and a sample mean. With confidence intervals, you won't be given a population proportion because that's what you're building the confidence interval for. The same idea is over here. With confidence intervals, you're just given the sample mean. Over here with confidence intervals, you're just given the sample proportion. But wait, over on this side, that was only true for the one sample cases. Is that true for one sample and two samples? Nope. This is all true for the one sample case. For the two sample case, things are similar, but slightly different. If we're doing hypothesis testing, we'd be given the sample proportions, two of them. If we're given confidence intervals, we'd be given the sample proportions, two of them. And if we had two samples, the population proportion, just like over here, would be assumed to be zero for two prop Z tests. That zero represents the difference between the two different population proportions. One last thing before I end this video. I say you're given the sample proportions, but that kind of comes in two different flavors. Over here, you'll always be told the sample mean and a standard deviation. Over here, you're always given enough information to figure out the sample proportion. One way that can be given to you is like it was up here, where you're told the sample size, n, and the number of successes, the number of those observations that have the given criteria. X is the letter you use for that. However, instead of telling you that of these 200 dogs, 75 of them had fleas, I could say that out of these 200 dogs, 37.5% of them have fleas. I can give you the sample proportion explicitly or implicitly. I can give you enough information to figure out the sample proportion. 75 out of 200 is 37.5%. But don't expect me to give you both. I'm going to give you one or the other. If I tell you 75 and 200, I want you to be able to figure out 37.5. And, and if I tell you 37.5 and, and 200, I want you to be able to figure out 75. The symbol for this 37.5, this sample proportion is P hat. And the way you connect these three items is p hat is always equal to x over n, and therefore x is always equal to n times p hat. All right, multiply both sides of this equation by n. If I give you x and n, figure out p hat this way. If I give you p hat and n, figure out x this way. Why do you need to know both? p hat comes into play with the center. x is something that you tell your calculator. That's definitely not everything with hypothesis testing and confidence intervals. Additional topics for you to review on your own is make sure you know how to state the null and alternative hypotheses, something that you'll always do on any hypothesis test. Make sure you know how to draw the appropriate picture, something I will ask you to do for every hypothesis testing or confidence interval question. Note that that picture looks different for hypothesis testing, whether you're using the p-value method or the classical method. That picture will also look different whether you have a left-tailed, a right-tailed, or a two-tailed test. And then finally, know how to state your conclusion. I'm going to write that because probably the easiest way to get a bunch of points on an intro to statistics class is properly stating your conclusion. If we're dealing with hypothesis testing, there's only two options. Either you reject the null hypothesis or you fail to reject the null hypothesis. One of those two things will happen on every single hypothesis testing question. How do you know what you're going to do? Well, it depends. If you're using the p-value method, then anytime your p-value is less than alpha, you're gonna reject the null hypothesis. If your p-value is greater than alpha, or I guess technically greater than or equal to alpha, you fail to reject the null hypothesis. If you're using the classical method, it's still these same two options, reject the null or fail to reject the null. But now it's not by comparing the p-value and alpha, it's by looking at the test statistic and seeing if that's in the rejection region. If the test statistic is in the rejection or critical region, you're gonna reject the null hypothesis. If the test statistic is not, then you fail to reject the null hypothesis. Only two options, reject the null hypothesis, fail to reject the null hypothesis. There's just two different ways you can come to those conclusions. Why do I care about the null hypothesis? What does that really mean? 
Well, that's the last stage of our conclusion. If you reject the null hypothesis, you're saying that the claim is true. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you're like, oh, let me stop you. I bet you say the claim is false. No, you never say the claim is false. If you fail to reject the null hypothesis, you can't say that the claim is true. Yeah, I know that's weird. It's not a true or false thing. It's either reject the null, which means the claim is true, or fail to reject the null, which means you can't say that the claim is true. You're going to be asked to do a lot of hypothesis testing on your final exam. And every single hypothesis testing question will ask you for the conclusion, and every conclusion will follow this flowchart. There's also a conclusion that you're going to write for confidence intervals, but that one's a little bit more straightforward, so I won't bother rehashing it in this video. I know that's a lot of information, and it's definitely overwhelming if this stuff is all new to you, but hopefully after doing this for the past couple of months, this was just a quick review and you already knew most or all of this stuff, and this video really just builds your confidence for the final exam. All right, hope that's useful.